I've held the title of data scientist at a number of different companies now, and in every single one of them, the nature of my job has been completely different. So in this video, it's story time, because I'm gonna tell you all about my previous jobs. I'm Richard, and this is Richard on Data. So there's all kinds of reasons for jobs to be significantly different from one another. Things like industry, size and maturity of the company, the company's leadership, there's tons of other reasons. So if you're trying to break into data science, I thought a video like this might be pretty instructive because you'll get a feel for the differences in the types of jobs out there, maybe more of a feel for the kind of job you're interested in, and some kind of sense about what the day-to-day -day of a job might look like. Before I get into that, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and also take just half a second to smash the like button because it really does help me with the YouTube algorithm. All right, so we're gonna go all the way to the beginning here just to lay some foundation. So when I got done with college, I immediately kept going to get my master's. The big idea for that being, I wanted to just get all my schooling done at once. I didn't wanna just be in school and then start making money and then have to stop making money. I just wanted to do it all at once. But during all of that time doing my master's, I worked as a graduate student instructor or what's commonly known as a TA. That's an experience that I wish more people could get, and if you ever get that opportunity, then I recommend taking it. And the reason is because there's this saying that there's no better way to retain and to remember things than to teach them. But through a previous internship that I had had, as well as through some connections in my department, I was able to get some early project experience as well. One of those was research on a botanical project. So essentially there was a research question and I was consulted to perform statistical review and suggestion of other methods. Then later I would get a summer engagement with a small education startup. So there was a big stakeholder there who was interested in the factors that were predictive of students failing their first class exam. And then lastly, in a capstone class, I was in a team that got connected with the surgical collective, and their goal was essentially to control for a variety of variables, most notably the type of procedure and the sickness of the patients. They wanted to understand which of their doctors were the best performers and the worst performers. So by this point, you might be thinking, okay, Richard, well, why are you telling me all these things that happened before you were done with school? Well, these opportunities were highly valuable in their own right, I would say the thing they caused me to grossly underestimate was how complicated and messy data is in the real world. For one thing, these data sets would often have a lot of features and variables in them, but they were at least reasonably well formatted and tidy. So it's really easy to look at these and then get somewhat naive about how complicated data is when it's generated by real world business processes. Now, when I was applying for jobs right before I wrapped up my master's, I was particularly interested in consulting companies. And part of that was because I was always pretty fascinated with the idea of traveling for work, but I also liked getting as engaged as possible with real human stakeholders. So my first job when I got done was in a small healthcare consulting company that was located right in my hometown. And when I say small, I literally mean it had fewer than 50 employees. So honestly, you couldn't have really crafted a more perfect position for me just getting done with all of my school. Now, I really do recommend thinking about what kind of industry you're the most interested in. And for me, that's always been healthcare. Now the company was in startup territory and it had major financial ups and downs, but it was an absolute blast from beginning to end. Two of the projects I was put on were travel projects with existing clients. So there were periods where every other week I would be flying to one of the two coasts. So that lifestyle is definitely not for everyone, especially if you're married and have kids, but at the time I loved it, it was perfect. Now technically going in, I knew SQL, even though I had never taken a formal college class on it, but I got thrust in the deep end with that really quickly. There were data sets with tens of millions of rows, columns with horribly formatted text data, features where you had absolutely no idea what anything meant unless you asked somebody, you name it. Now one interesting thing about the analytics team that we had was there wasn't exactly standards put in place for what technologies to use. 
The data sets were stored in SQL databases, so obviously SQL was a big cornerstone for what we were doing, but after that point, there were some people wrapping analysis up in Excel, some people were using R for everything, there were some projects where it was pretty much all R-based, not as much SQL, and we would share analysis notebooks back and forth by pushing and pulling from GitHub. It was kind of all over the place. The emphasis was more on delivering value to the clients, and it's just whatever tool that you're most comfortable with or will allow you to do that best, just use that. And I remember one project was a little slow, so I caught myself thinking, okay, I learned R in school and I've been using it for all these projects up to this point. I'm gonna use this opportunity to learn Python. And so the first time I did that and actually applied it to a project, it was a little rough, but as they say, the rest is history. So eventually, due to some of the financial challenges of the company, among other things, after about three years, I decided that it was time for me to move on. So I found another small-ish company that was also located in the Detroit area, which was where I lived at the time. Now this wasn't a consulting company, at least in the traditional sense. So the company works in the life sciences industry, and the company functions as a data-driven clinical research organization. And to clarify what I mean by small-ish, they were about 500 people for a global headcount, which is small in the grand scheme of things, but it was about 10x larger than the company that I had just come from. Now, how I got hired at this company is actually a pretty interesting story in its own right. So what had happened was, I applied to a senior manager position that I was totally underqualified for. At the time, I knew I was underqualified, but I thought, why not? Let's at least give it a shot and see what happens. Needless to say, I didn't get a senior manager gig, but the people that I interviewed with really liked me, and it just so happened a couple weeks later that the company got this contract with one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and the contract called for a full-time R Shiny developer. Now actually, R Shiny was something that I had picked up at my first job, and I ended up trying to get really good at it in my free time. The reason being, I just found all these use cases where I figured it could be really helpful for taking our products to the next level. And before you knew it, because I had this skill, it led to another door opening. So there's really two takeaways from all of this. Number one, don't rule out a job just because you appear to be somewhat underqualified for it because you just never know what's going to happen. And then number two, grow your skills as much as possible, especially early in your career. The more skills you have, just the more options that are going to be available to you. So I spent one full year as an R Shiny developer. Now that may or may not sound boring, but it was actually a pretty significant time for me. R Shiny can force you to think in pretty sophisticated ways about the R programming language. And even beyond that, you really have to put a lot of thought into how to design apps that are easy to use, aesthetically pleasing, and ultimately useful for some end user. Plus, while I was doing some of this, on the side, I was doing some other things for my organization, like building data science processes, and also helping to vet the Julia programming language. That's where I came to learn about that and what inspired my videos on that topic. Now that large contract as an R Shiny developer was eventually scaled back due to the pandemic. So that had just begun to take off and it was just over one year of sitting in that position. I kept going with this company for about a year after that, but then it was actually the inspiration for another video I did before about why I quit my data science job. And the main reason for that was Although I love the people there, I found myself stagnating a little bit and not growing in all the areas that I wanted to be growing in. I was already senior level at the time, but I actually wanted to take a step back. And the reason for that was I just wanted to have people around me and above me that I could learn from and just sort of absorb new information from. So I went through a pretty rigorous interview process and I eventually landed a position at an ad tech company where that position was going to be fully remote. And interestingly, in terms of size and scale, this company was another tenfold increase. My first company was about 50 people, my second company was about 500 people, and this company was about 5,000 people. 
But then also at the time, I had already been planning my move to Nashville. That was something that I talked about in my recent life update video. And because it was sort of at the tail end of the pandemic when the great resignation period was going on, so remote jobs were taking off everywhere. And I really wanted a remote job just to support the lifestyle that I planned to go into for the next year. Now this company had a tech stack that was completely different from anywhere that I'd been in the past. To kind of put this into perspective, my first company, it was a SQL and Python and R mix for me. Then the second company, it was kind of a mixture of R and Julia. And then in this company, it was all Python and Spark. So let's unpack that a little bit. The environment there, probably about 90% of the time or more, utilized Jupyter Notebooks, where the code in them was written in Python. Now, I could spend an entire video talking about my opinions on that setup, but that's a separate topic for another day. But also they utilized a big data framework known as HDFS, or that is the Hadoop Distributed File System. And the data would get accessed by querying it using the PySpark API. In practice, what that means is writing some Apache Spark code using PySpark in Jupyter Notebooks, so transforming it a little bit in a SQL-like fashion, and then letting standard Python packages like NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn take over after that point. Now, Python wasn't new to me at all by that time, but Spark and HDFS and really the entire way that the business operated was totally new to me. So it was definitely a learning curve for me there, but that was fine because that's exactly why I wanted to be there in the first place. That was also where I first got to experience data with counts of rows in the billions, so that's nice. So I ended up only staying at that position for a little over a year, and there are a few reasons for that. First and foremost was, I found that I just wasn't super passionate about the ad tech space. It was interesting, sure, but I found I was just missing that passion and that fire that was inside of me that I knew existed when I was working on healthcare problems. And another big personal thing for me was I was living in a big brand new city at the time and I was starting to feel a little lonely and alienated just working in a remote position where all of my coworkers lived in a different state. I had thought at the time that a remote position was what I wanted, but I found eventually that I just sort of preferred a hybrid or an office setup that was somewhat close to home. So then that brings me to my current position. So a more detailed walkthrough of exactly what my day-to-day -day looks like is the subject for another video, but I'll share some high-level details. I work at, I believe, the single largest employer in the Nashville area, and I'm back in the healthcare space. And in terms of the size and scale of the company, it's more than a 10x increase from my last company. Matter of fact, the headcount at the company might be all the way up to 300,000. And it's also easily the most challenging job that I've ever had. And the single biggest reason for that is the sheer size and complexity of the data. I learned from my first job in healthcare, sometimes the hard way, that really understanding the underlying business processes that generate data is critically important. And there's tons of reasons for that. For one, without that knowledge, you're not going to understand things like what certain features mean, why some data is missing, is it missing at random, or is it missing for some kind of reason, uh, what various categories mean, all kinds of other things. And without that knowledge, it's really easy to just kind of spin your wheels endlessly, working on something that you think is useful, and then you come to find out later that it has no practical value whatsoever to your stakeholders. Well, this is all doubly and triply true as the size and complexity of data increases. In terms of the tech stack here, it's primarily Python based, but there is some SQL sprinkled in there, and the Google Cloud Platform, or GCP, is used as key infrastructure. And I have a whole video about getting the GCP machine learning engineer certification, but long and short of it, there's tons of features and resources to learn in the GCP environment, and it's definitely significantly different from querying data from HDFS. But it's all instances of upskilling, and my focus last year, and to a certain extent this year too, is around just growing my skills in things like ML ops, deploying applications to production, containerization, test-driven development, that kind of space. 
So yeah, that's been the story of all my different jobs. So there's some summary takeaway points that I want to conclude with. First of all, there's a caveat here that all of this job history is prior to the age of ChatGPT and LLMs. When I landed my most recent position, it was actually the same month that OpenAI released ChatGPT to the public. So that's definitely going to change the landscape of jobs out there going forward. Secondly, something I've tried to emphasize is that no two tech stacks have been even remotely the same. In some places it's been cloud-based, in some places it's on-prem, in some places there's a hard Python requirement, some places it's flexible, and some places everyone uses scripts, and some places everyone uses notebooks. But finally, and this is probably the most important point, the most challenging thing to me at every position, and especially at transitioning from one position to another, is learning the company's business processes and just understanding the data more. So every business and their clients have their own processes based on how they operate their business and what they do, and generating data is downstream from that. And you can't really move the needle very much until you're an expert at the underlying business and data. And that's hard. Honestly, I've been in my current position for a little over a year now, and I'm still, every single week, just learning new things about the data that I didn't know a week before. Now, in previous companies, there had always been a sort of a ramp up of, let's say, three months or six months, maybe up to a year, before I could reach my maximal productivity, just because there's all that understanding and learning about the domain that I needed to do first. And there's not many guarantees in the data science world, but that's as close to a guarantee as it gets. You are going to have to dig a lot of your time into understanding data and then eventually learning how to clean it and manipulate it. But that's fine. You'll learn a lot in the process and the amount of skills that you'll have, and by extension of that, hopefully the amount of money that you earn will go up. Overall, I've probably worked at more companies than average for someone who's been out of school for the length of time that I have but I've learned so much along the way that I really wouldn't have it any other way. So I hope this has been a helpful and interesting video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button. If you hated it, then I guess you're free to hit the dislike button as well. Leave me a comment down below and let me know, have you had multiple data science jobs before? And if so, what was your experience? Were they really similar? Were they really different? Let me know in the comments down below. And I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.